Hey everyone, before we open today's file, please make sure to follow us on Instagram at d.s.radio where you can find all the images that go along with today's case. You can drop us an email at contact.dsradio at gmail.com. You can find all of our socials in the Linktree bio on our Instagram profile, including links to merch. If you're feeling especially generous, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio, where you can get access to our exclusive Instagram page and make suggestions for upcoming episode topics that you would like us to cover. Speaking of Patreon, thanks to our Patreons, Riff Cult, Cropley Crab, Cash Broadus, Raspberry Jr., Jason R. Nelson, Creepy Paper, Jamie Suit, Michael Laughlin, Lindsay Keller, Mike Wright, Gria Weaver, Kelsey Carithers, Linz Gibbon, Drake Holvig, Only Child, Michael M, Wesley Akers, Riaz K, Emily Medeiros, Pip, Heather Wynn, Graves, Devin Sweatshirt, The Ordained Sinister Minister, and Philip Hoffman. Hi everyone and welcome to Dystopian Simulation Radio. I'm your host Linz. And I'm your other host Chris. How's it going Linz? My voice sounds very stupid as you can probably tell. I have a really sore throat and it seems to be stripping the British out of me somehow. (laughs) This is where you become (laughs) Swedish. I don't know what's happened but yeah I, I mean it's the height of summer and I have a cold so there's that. I'm absolutely sweating. I know that's TMI, but it's so hot here. It's beautiful here, but it's really hot right now and it's just... How hot is it? My bangs are sticking to my forehead. I think it's like 25, which um, feels a lot hotter here. Ooh, that is hot for a British girl. That's, uh, that's 77 in Fahrenheit, apparently. I'm sure that's not hot for people who live in really sunny states, but you know... I don't, I don't know what that means, really. I'm trying to sound good and translate for the u.s audience that is lucky because they're our biggest audience so we probably should do that (laughs) but um yeah how are you chris what's how is it back over in blighty oh i'm all good man it's it's good since the last time we spoke i had a birthday um Mm. and uh, i became a year younger which is interesting (laughs) and yeah i'm generally all good it's all gravy um i did hear an interesting fact the other day though oh hell yeah did you know it's illegal to laugh loudly in Hawaii. That can't be true. It is. Is that a dad joke? No, 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 no. It's it's completely true. Apparently the police come around and make sure you keep it to aloha. <laughs> you are so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whenever I speak to you or Michael, I just know it's going to be a dad joke. Like, if you go, oh, guess what happened the other day? My brain just goes into defense mode where I'm like, it's a fucking dad joke and I can't work it out and I know it's one. <laughs> it, it happens, man. Like Once you've had at least one child, it kind of like flows through your veins. Yeah, apparently it really friggin' does. It's a thing. And it's, you know, it's the same as so like everyone who has a kid and is a male will start making stupid dad jokes. And every man is pre-installed with Shaggy's singing voice. It's <laughs> just how it is. <laughs> So, All right. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, enough bullshit. People don't like the bullshit. We're going to get into the story. But before we do, Chris... It's all bullshit. <laughs> yeah, shut up. Don't tell them. They'll realize and they'll go. <laughs> I mean, I, I want to believe. 
I don't know why you're just slaying me today. <laughs> Everything you say is ridiculous. Okay, so before we do get on with this very interesting Swedish story that I have for you, Chris, Ooh. would you like to direct the people to the Instagram where they can see all the visuals that go along with this? And there is a very good visual for this one. No problem at all. So if you're interested in seeing the images that are associated with today's story, you can head over to our Instagram, which is at d.s. Dot radio and if you're not already make sure you follow us right there for all of the latest updates mm-hmm. and also you can become a patreon at patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation and that gives you access to our special secret instagram the friend club which is a very silly play on the F- misfits fiend club <laughs> it's the best we could come up with in the moment okay <laughs> We did spend a long five minutes thinking about that. I think I, I actually think we came up with that after going to a cafe and standing in the rain before we parted ways. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. Yeah. So if you if you are a member of our Patreon, which is uh, patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio, you left off the radio bit before. Oh, don't. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sick. Uh, then that means that you get exclusive access to our Patreon page the uh, no well yes to the patreon page but all oh, i suck at this to the <laughs> instagram page which is at dsr friend club yes sorry i was taking a drink <laughs> we are not on our game today but this is what you all expect from us i think at this point we're in rare form today <laughs> yeah oh one more thing a couple of you have been sending us pictures of the t-shirts that you ordered so we can now confirm that they look freaking sick they look so good. Yes. And you can get those from tpublic.com forward slash stores forward slash DS radio. Chris apparently has been saying it wrong the last two times, but somehow you found it. It's those investigation skills that you all have, I think. <laughs> exactly. And, and also some of you have been using the referral link as well. Which we haven't given out, uh, which, which is very spooky. Creepy. Stop it. Well, actually, you're giving us money, so keep doing it. But stop it. Um <laughs> And you're saving money. <laughs> but we'll put that link along with all of the other links that are there, which in the, uh, the the link tree, which is in our Instagram. So if you're sick of us giving you addresses, and you probably are five minutes into this podcast, just head over to our <laughs> Instagram bio and you'll find them all in one easy place. Yes, exactly. So Chris, let's let's get into this. We have explored all sorts of extraterrestrial beings on this podcast, from full-on broccoli boys in the Yorkshire Hills to stinky starfish invaders in Japan. But today, we are heading back to Sweden, not too far from Engelholm UFO incident, to a place called Domstein in Helsingborg. Now, I have travelled these roads, Chris, I know them well, and I'm currently out here in the field absorbing all of the alien weirdness that the south of Sweden has to offer. So... You don't sound like you're in a field. <laughs> Helsingborg is a city on the coast of southern Sweden, and we're going to zoom in on the map to a small village of just over 600 residents. The village of Domstein. Other than its historical beginnings, Domstein isn't known for much. However, in the 50s, a story emerged from the village that had those in the paranormal community flapping gums. Those with a particular interest in UFOs and aliens might recognize this village by name and as the backdrop of a very intriguing encounter of the fourth kind. Today, Chris, we are going to explore the case of the Domstein blobs. (laughs) Uh, Okay. Um... Blobs mean something very different to me. Uh, oh, yeah. So I hope yeah. Uh, please go on. So this case takes place in the late 50s, 1958 to be exact, when the population of Domstein was around 200 people. They are two main characters in this story. So we have Hans Gustafsson, who is a 25-year-old truck driver, and Stig Reidberg, a 30-year-old student. Let's take a look at Hans and Stig, Chris. If you could describe them to the listeners, please. Absolutely. It's a fucking lootly. Okay, so we have a picture of two Caucasian gentlemen sitting next to each other. Hans, I do believe, is in the background. We're not quite sure on this, but he does appear to be the younger of the two. So that's what we're going to go along with. So Hans first, he's quite a, a chiseled chap. He's got a, 
a nice little flick of hair that's falling down uh, just onto his forehead there. He's got a very strong jawline. He's wearing a suit and tie, basically, but it's a more relaxed version. I think that might be an overcoat that he has on over the top of it, a long black tie. And then you've got Stig in the foreground, who is got more curly brown hair from the looks of it. Could be black. It is a black and white photograph, but I'd put money on it being brown. And he's also wearing a tie with an overcoat, but in between it, he's got some sort of vest that your grandpa might wear. <laughs> yeah, um, two very dapper looking chaps. Yeah, they're both they're both good looking young young men about town. Yeah, Hans has a bit of a um, Johnny Depp hair flick a la crybaby hair flick yeah that little bit of hair hanging down the front the german what hair, oh hair flick <laughs> you're so funny <laughs> <laughs> sorry that took me a minute is that a low a low i think these references just falling out of me today <laughs> you are so silly on the evening of December 19th, 1958, Hans and Stig drove two miles from Domstein to Hergenas in Hans' DKW Combi. They claimed they were going to pick up a couple of girls they knew and go for a drive. Earlier in the day, they had finished a shift at a laundromat in Helsingborg, which was owned by Stig's mother. According to the newspapers around the time, both men were living in Stig's mother's home in Helsingborg following breakdowns in relationships with their wives. Mm. Hans and Stig met the girls in Hergenas at around 10.30pm. This journey would have taken them an average of 25 minutes. The four spent a few hours in each other's company until Hans decided it was time to head back to Helsingborg. They dropped off the girls back in Hergenas at around 2.30am and headed back home to get something to eat on the way. Sausages, if you're curious, Chris. Mm. Sorry, girls, gotta go. Sausages. Sorry, girls, you can't compete with sausage. <laughs> so Hans and Stig were on their merry way, but at around 3am, a fog rolls in and they began having difficulties with visibility. They squinted into the mist and suddenly noticed a bright shining light coming from a nearby cluster of pine trees. They pulled over to get a closer inspection, both exiting the vehicle and walking around 35 feet towards the glowing orb. As they approached the light, they realized it was actually a glowing disc that was darker at the center, around 16 feet in diameter and 3 feet high propped up on three slanted legs. As they got closer, they noticed several small grey beings around the structure, none of which seemed to have legs or arms, but instead resembled, quote, scones or skittles. They had soft bodies, were strong and tactical, and communicated through buzzing sounds. The men said they somehow understood that these jelly aliens were telepathic. There's so much to unpack in here. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, okay. there's more. The, the, hold on, hold on. <laughs> just, just, just time out, time out. So for, firstly, yes. I do appreciate that these, these guys, you know, much like um, Richard Heen from our story last week, they don't have time to load their pickup truck. They just need to pick up chicks. <laughs> So I, I assume that they were using a prototype of the Heeny Duty to, uh, to you know, load everything onto the trailer there so they could just concentrate on picking up girls. And sausages. But Sorry, and sausages. <laughs> but sorry, what, what was in these sausages? Because, oh, hold on, <laughs> that description that you said, they were, they had no legs. No arms. They were shaped no like legs. scones, scones or skittles. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm assuming that this is the... Uh, the, the British use of the word scone. I believe which, so, um, yes. Is that, an, is that an English muffin? <laughs> yes. It's, it's... I'm, trying my, I'm trying my best here in this translation stuff. <laughs> um, the, they were soft but strong and tactical. Yes. <laughs> so let's let's find out why they were strong and tactical. If I'm ever single again, I know what's going on my Tinder profile. <laughs> no arms, no legs, jelly-like, strong and tactical. <laughs> It's, it suits me to a T. Sounds like Chris. 
So the creatures began to attack Hans and Stig, <laughs> gripping onto them and attempting to drag them away towards the craft. The two Swedes struggled against them, of which they were four in total, and when Stig threw a punch, his arm disappeared into the creature's body. Let's listen to Stig's account of the struggle as narrated by our Swedish correspondent, Robin. All of a sudden, we were attacked by four lead grey creatures, about four feet tall and 14 inches in width. They seemed to lack extremities, looking sort of like scones or skittles. But when they attacked us, they clutched us firmly and attempted to drag us towards the craft. It was difficult to defend oneself because we could get no real hold on the jelly-like creatures. My right arm sank as far as the elbow into one of them when I tried to box myself loose. They smelled like stale marsh. At one time, all four were on me. It is difficult to explain now, but I got the impression the things could read my thoughts. The second before I had time to get a real hold of them, they parried the hold I was planning. The raw strings was not great. But they were very technical. Luckily, there was a camping sign near where I was standing and I clasped my arm around the pole. We have estimated that the struggle lasted between four and seven minutes. The creatures concentrated their effort on Hans and suddenly I found myself free. They just ignored me. I took the opportunity to run to the car and began to blow the horn. I watched through the windshield and I saw Hans clutch at the pole and the creatures tore at him to get him loose. He was holding the pole and they had him spread out horizontally from it. As soon as the horn sounded they released him and he fell to the ground with a thump. I rushed to him and the saucer rose into the air. The light from it became more intense and we were aware of a smell that reminded us of ether and burned sausages. But most remarkable of all was the sound the object made. A thin, high, intense sound you felt rather than heard. When the object left, we were shaken by powerful, extremely rapid vibration that quite paralyzed us. Well, um... That's a story. Um, <laughs> that's definitely a story. Uh, <laughs> right. So as, just to, to summarize, then, these guys were picking up jigs. They went to get some sausages. And <laughs> suddenly they found themselves being assaulted by aliens resembling Skittles. Then somehow managed to break three because they were scared of a horn. <laughs> and uh, then drove home, decided they were never going to tell anybody until they did. Yeah, let's get to that later. And they, then, <laughs> then, then they told, told everybody. Yeah. Exactly. It's funny how that works. Yeah, so after escaping the blobs, Hans and Stig rushed back to the car. They disagreed on how the craft left the scene, with Stig saying the craft shot up directly and Hans saying it hovered up and away over the water. Once the craft was out of sight, the men, back in the safety of the vehicle, broke down in a state of shock and burst into tears. After 15 minutes or so, they pulled themselves together and continued to drive towards Helsingbori. Now, Chris, we have a sketch of the aliens here. Yes! If you could describe this amazing representation of the aliens to the listeners. No problem. I love it when we have a sketch. All the best stories involve sketches. I agree. And this is a... No exception. Uh, okay. Uh, right. <laughs> so, um, so we've got a picture of the aliens and a little caption here. One appears to be a, a side profile and the other appears to be maybe a front-on view. Uh, it says for a little caption, the unearthly loaf-shaped creatures are sketched by Rydberg and Gustafsson. So I guess that they're kind of equating it to 
a loaf of bread. I would say that these guys look like big almonds. That's exactly what I thought. An almond yeah. and cousin it. <laughs> that yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, uh, cousin it and the giant almond. Yeah. I can't really describe any more to than that, folks. Yep. That's what it is. Yep, that's the best way to describe what these guys have drawn. Very unique when it comes to sketches of aliens. I would say. Yeah, um, I mean they're not. They're more like amorphous blobs as opposed to anything you might recognize as a being it's more like a i don't know it's like an amoeba or something than a creature yeah i mean i have never seen another alien sketch like this or a description of an alien like this but um yeah big almond cousin it that's pretty much all we can give you guys to go on but it will be on the instagram d.s.radio so don't forget to have a look and see and comment about what you think they look like but i i don't see you disagreeing with us on this <laughs> so although stig and hans said that they didn't intend to share the story with anyone they look so burdened that people eventually began asking if something bad had happened to them the men finally shared their experience and decided that since it was an unknown craft they should report it to the Swedish Department of Defence, as well as the media. How did that go down? A paper in the south of Sweden picked up the story, and a journalist went out to the scene of the alien attack. A photographer that went along with him took a picture of a thin, shallow impression in the dirt that the men claimed was left behind by the craft. Strangely, they did not mention to the journalist the fight that they had with the blobs. And they were also quite wishy-washy with the details of times and dates, and the time frame became really vague which is usually a sign that someone is lying in the true crime world. Mm. You know, if a story constantly changes and details change. But they did stick to the core story. It's just that the details would kind of change here and there. So they were not believed by their friends or family. However, soon the story made its way into the papers and Hans and Stig found themselves undergoing what is believed to be the first case of hypnoanalysis in a UFO-related case. The session was performed by one Dr. Lars Eric Essen and Killam Helsen, and the men were assessed for their mental health and each of them found to be sane. So this is the first instance of hypnoanalysis in a UFO case. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. And very early, late 50s. Well, yeah, I mean, when we did the, the Yorkshire Moore Alien, no, that's right, the Ilkley Moore Alien mm -hmm. case, that also featured quite a lengthy segment that we did around hypno regression yes. when it came to aliens. So it's, it's interesting that this is where it was pioneered. Yeah. So Dr. Essen tried to get to the bottom of this strange experience and wanted to try and determine if it was possibly a shared hallucination. By his findings, he concluded that it was not a hallucination and instead believed that, quote, the experience came directly from outside. So Chris, if you could read the following excerpt here. Dr. Essen told the press, it may be added that the men's attitude was of a very sober kind. They do not want to put any thrills or any feature of the incident, exaggerate or embellish it, or even attempt to interpret their experiences. They only want to communicate them. He also said they were both very receptive to this form of analysis, and I hold, as a matter of result, that it was one of the most successful analyses I ever made. So these doctors believed that the men had had some kind of experience, but they didn't believe some form of extraterrestrial contact had been made. The Swedish military brought in their own psychologist, a one Dr. Michael Washter, and he had, well, a more critical analysis of Hans and Stig. They took a closer look at the personal lives of the two men, and their findings were published in a newspaper at the time. They revealed that Stig had once served in the military but was discharged in the late 40s due to his agoraphobia. They identified Stig as, quote, the leader of the two. I'll let you read the military's findings, Chris. It developed that Weidberg... <laughs> <laughs> That's so long. Too long to read in a funny accent. <laughs> no. It developed that Weidberg was excused from military service in 1948 because of agoraphobia, morbid fear of being in an open space. Both men have had no real training for any trade. Rydberg appeared to be the leader. He's more talkative than Gustafsson. Rydberg gives an impression of nervousness. 
He shifts his position according to what he deems to be the most favourable to support his trustworthiness. He seems somewhat afraid and tries to guard himself. When he is pressed, his constant resort is to refer to his experience and state that he cannot help that he has experienced it. That the scuffle or fight was kept secret for some time, the investigators find peculiar. The statements lacked stringency, they are diffuse, sometimes directly unreasonable, or even proven incorrect. He exploits his situation to a certain extent, emphasising the fact that he has voluntarily put himself at the disposal of the cross-examiners with regard to the interest of the press and other circles in this matter. Gustafsson is not so talkative, says Dr. Watcher. He often replies as if he rattles off a lesson. He refers to what he has said earlier and does not intend to say anything else. Somebody might have told Gustafsson to stick to his story and not to deviate from it one bit. Gustafsson is a fit victim for suggestive influence. As to Ryberg, it is not unreasonable to hold that the spiritualistic influences of his mother may have given him considerable impulses towards his world of conceptions. Summing up, the credibility of both men ought to be strongly put into question. They are deemed as possessing a lesser reliability. They both seem to be convinced of the truth in their experiences. The possibility that the issue here is of a direct invention cannot be excluded. Most probable is that Reitberg is a victim of autosuggestion and that he, in his turn, has influenced Gustafsson. Irrespective of their subjective conviction, there are weighty reasons present to seriously question the trustworthiness of both men as witnesses in this matter. Thank you, Chris. So the military basically shat on them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like a, a that's scathing version of a... D- Distract. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's scathing, isn't it? It's like, damn, yeah. I only came to tell you my alien story and you're like, he got discharged from the military. They live with their moms. They're total losers. Don't believe them. It's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have noticed in there that they said something about auto-suggestion, uh-huh. which, okay, I was like, auto-suggestion, whatever this is, in psychology, can it really be responsible for two men having the shared experience of fighting alien blobs and escaping them? Like, so I I had to look it up a little bit, like what really is, like, do you know what auto-suggestion is? Um, no, I don't know. I would, I'd hasten to guess that it's where you are subjectively, you know, influenced by something, uh, whether it, I don't know if it's your subconscious if it's doing the order of suggestion, uh, but you can see you can see how one person could do it to another person, but where the idea would come from originally, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, so in psychology, auto suggestion is essentially self induced suggestions guided by one's own feelings or thoughts. So people often mm. make positive suggestions to themselves to improve self esteem or morale, kind of similar to that of the placebo effect. So if before you go to bed, you're like. I'm amazing, I'm successful, I'm Chris, I'm awesome. And then you wake up and you say it again and do it every day. Like they say that psychologically you'll start to like get some more self-esteem. But there's a couple of different types of auto-suggestion, which is intentional and unintentional. So okay. they are the kind of... What you laid out there then was an intentional one, which is like... Yeah, um, it's kind of a therapy almost. Yeah, exactly. Affirmations. But there's a couple of different ones. So intentional and unintentional. Affirmation, a positive statements <laughs> that make us feel good about ourselves. Snoop Dogg's, uh, <laughs> Snoop yes. Dogg's children's album is excellent, by the way. The kind of self-explanatory. So intentional is deliberate and unintentional is unconscious. But how extreme can cases of unintentional auto-suggestion actually be? So unconscious auto-suggestion can actually come about if the thoughts of the person persistently dominate their mind over an extensive period of time, to the point where it comes sort of programming. They seem to imply that Stig might have conjured up And that Hans was so suggestible that he just came along for the ride, which seems for two grown men a bit far-fetched in my opinion. But yeah, this is what the military came to. And it was said that the military didn't take this story seriously at all. And they were just going through the motions, which I suppose you can't blame them for. 
I mean, they're used to looking mm. at things that compromise defense of the country. And here they are listening to a story about jelly monsters. I do think it was a bit hardcore to be like, they're skillless and socially inept and discredit them in the newspaper, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> so can I, can I, well, I think it's an interesting idea, but I, these things often come up like, so it's a bit like the idea about mass hysteria, which we talked about in the Hopkinsville alien uh, incident, where these ideas are, are great, but in actuality, they're so few and far between in history that multiple people even more than one experience a shared delusion Mm -hmm. that are not influenced by drugs or alcohol or some kind of substance that it just seems to be the go-to excuse yeah it does feel like that. oh these guys had some form of shared delusion or oh it was the power of auto suggestion i mean the questions that i have spiraling off this are firstly were there any drugs or alcohol involved? I mean, they went off partying with a couple of, you know, young girls from a nearby town. It's not unusual to think that they may have had a couple of drinks. Yeah, I mean, they were known to have a drink. Let's just say that. I don't know on that night, but they were known to drink. And I feel mm. like maybe they had. But have you ever been so drunk that you've fought alien blobs? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, if I'm completely honest. Um <laughs> I haven't. Yeah. Some, uh, you know, I mean, some people do completely lose it. You know, they they, they blank out. Yeah, Dave syndrome. Yeah, they just they just pass out <laughs> and they're just gone. But I don't know. I, that sounds pretty. This is like a really extreme version of "Dude, where's my car?" If that's the case, because <laughs> yeah, like you know, oh, oh, I woke up and oh, what happened? Oh, we must have been fighting alien beings last night. Is that why we're in bed together? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> when I said let's go get sausages, yeah. this is not what I meant. That was not the sausage I wanted. <laughs> Why are they German I, now? I, I guess one is called Hans. <laughs> I don't know. Everything sounds funnier in a German accent. <laughs> that sounds better. <laughs> I was about to say we should all have German accents, but that's probably a yeah. bit well, they tried. historically insensitive. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I probably shouldn't say that. Okay, so yeah, I'm not sure that... Uh, Auto suggestion is the answer here. Did either of them have a predisposition towards aliens or the unknown? You know, like you'd think if there was auto suggestion that there may be some suggestion that they were preoccupied with these beings. Yeah, I do think they had an interest in this case. Like not in this case, an interest in sort of, you know, aliens and stuff. Uh, Which okay. I mean, now it's kind of common, but I, no, but I guess back in the 50s, we were just starting to get like contactee stories and interviews and stuff. And there were some pretty not, big figures in the in the game. But um, yeah, they... Not that long after Roswell. Exactly. So yeah, they, they were definitely, you know, it was on their mind. They were interested in it a little bit. So... And I suppose you've got to think as well, now we've got a very clear idea of what an alien is in, in our minds. Mm-hmm. You know, a few classic ones and it's it's quite rare that you get a story like the stinky starfish which we covered in the archives <laughs> yeah. where there's an alien being that doesn't fit you know either gray reptilian nordic something along those lines yeah so you know now people tend to fall into one of those categories when they're talking about aliens but at the time this is the, the mid 50s not that long after roswell media hasn't maybe made its way all the way to sweden yet to fully define our idea of what an alien quote unquote should look like actually like sweden has a lot of early spiritualism and paranormal and alien cases they have their own like ufologists and they were in the game quite early as well and they were in contact with Mm. the us and the uk and stuff through various magazines so they you know aliens were probably the same as everywhere else like people knew what they were they knew the big cases and everything like Mm. that and i think um, there was a lot of books published apparently that that got around so i think they were definitely aware of uh you know they've they've got no excuses for making up such stupid bloody aliens yeah i mean giant almond (laughs) yeah the almond like what the like if i would i would come up with like you know like if you had to come up with your own alien like, you just had to make some shit up and tell this story to the world. Like, what would you describe yours as? I'd probably be, probably resemble an octopus in some way. Like, you mm. know, have like, you know. Simpson style. 
yeah, yeah, Kang and Kodos, you know, it would be pro- probably that. Something yeah, I do lines. like some some Sphinx cat, like mutant thing or something like rad, not like a jelly bag. <laughs> yes, the man. It's always watching. It's always watching. Right, we're going off topic here. So anyway. <laughs> so you know what? One thing that I did think, though, is if you punched one of these jelly aliens and ripped your hand back out of it, wouldn't there be residue that you would describe? Like it was cold and it was... Maybe. I mean, it, you know, it's, it depends what it stayed these on my clothes. beings are actually made of. I mean, I mean... Oh, are you thinking they're just force? Well, like literally yeah. just sort I mean, of... We're getting that they are... They are putting force onto these other uh, onto the, the boys they yeah. are you know restraining them somehow but is that through physical strength is it uh, telekinesis is it something else but are these you know beings that exist on a different plane to us and that's the reason why they appear such a a bizarre form mm, i like your your thinking there and also we're quite near the water so are they? Did they come from above? Did they come from below? Who knows? Terror from the deep. Yes. So Stig and Hans went on a little tour with their story around Sweden as well as Denmark. The story made it around the world and was published in several big UFO and Fortean magazines of the time. They were also interviewed by National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, or NICAP. And big-time Swedish ufologist, Klaus Svan did a deep dive of his own into the case some years later. So over the course of a year and a half, he made a buttload of phone calls, dived into the newspaper archives, interviewed people, and eventually returned with an 88-page report debunking the case, in his opinion. Yep. What was the guy's name? Remember, Klaus Van. He's like really famous here. He does like everything UFO everything alien he's on it if you don't know class fan you should definitely look him up like everyone should just go and google him right now he's got tons of stuff out there so remember the doctors who performed the hypnoanalysis yes well they actually had an interest in aliens and the paranormal which is likely why they were interested to meet stig and hans in the first place and question them ah okay that Uh, explains a little bit you know they've got a mm. Uh, I'm not sure what it's called. There's some kind of bias, but they're, they're, they're looking for something and they're going to find it if they go looking for it. Yeah, they were not impartial to analyse these guys. Like, how strange is that, though? It's not often you hear that the doctors who do the hypnosis stuff actually are like UFO heads. No, it, it, you could kind of get it from their statement, though, when they're like, this is the most successful ever. Um, yeah, implying exactly. That, that maybe they've tried this before. But this is the one that works. And, the, and like Hans and Stig could have just been like playing along with it. And they were like, wow, this is working great. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple of theories about what this UFO could have been. So it was proposed that the two could have seen the lights of a nearby Polish ship docked up near Helsingborg, Or perhaps were attacked by a flock of sheep. Um, that's an interesting theory. I would love to hear more about it. Um, <laughs> that's all there is, Chris. You know as much as I do. <laughs> but I mean, I'm assuming that I don't know. It's, it's just a I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm making assumptions here. But if you weren't just solely raised in a city, you've probably met a sheep before in your life. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you've never met one. They are like fluffy clouds with some heads and legs. Well, well, generally one one head, uh, but four legs. And that doesn't really look like an almond. But I mean, sometimes they get so fluffy that you can't really see the legs f- from like a, your human height looking down. And if it's dark and they all come in herd and they're all going, Meh, you're like, oh no, a high pitched noise. And then suddenly you're being like trapped in all of this wool. And you're like punching some sheep and trying to <laughs> escape. <laughs> I mean, this sounds like a, a hilarious early movie directed by Peter Jackson. It's amazing, it's, isn't um, it? <laughs> it's by far my favorite theory so far. It, I mean, it's it's an interesting take on it. I think, though, that these boys, unless they were exceptionally drunk. <laughs> Which they could have they, been. Because <laughs> you know, they said, I, they punched the being, the hand went straight through it. You would have felt like... If you punch, I've never punched a sheep, Chris. 
Have you? Have you not? <laughs> uh, I would not like to admit to uh, what I do in my free time on this podcast. <laughs> Geordie sheep punch. Yeah. So another theory was they were um, overcome with a swamp gas, which would explain mm. the horrible burned sausage smell. But, you know, after a belly full of sausages and schnapps, uh, who knows how you perceive things over in the south of Sweden? <laughs> mm. Well, these are in- interesting theories. Um, so essentially we've got, it's it's a real alien encounter. Mm-hmm. Polish ship. Polish ship, which I'm, I want to come back to that one. Um, <laughs> sheep. Yep. Sheep. She- um, Flock of sheep. A tsunami of sheep. <laughs> uh, or a swamp gas. Yeah. So the, this Polish ship. Mm-hmm. What? 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 Why? <laughs> there was just a Polish ship that had to dock near Helsingborg because of bad weather or something. And they were like, maybe huh? they saw the lights of the ship and thought it was a UFO. And it's like, okay. Oh. And then and then the sheep came. And then when, when we put it all together. So, you know, Polish ship, lights. So we've, we've got a comedy of errors. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, Flock of sheep, punching jelly blobs, swamp gas, stinky sausages. I mean, mm. if you were proposing me the plot of the new Naked Gun movie... <laughs> I would be going along with this, but I, I don't think that all of these things happened. Naked fun. <laughs> Class Van found out that the military had some gripes with the guy's story. For example, could the signpost that Stig was hanging on to to defend himself against the alien abduction actually be strong enough to hold a man who was basically horizontal and being pulled by such a strong force towards an alien ship? Apparently, hmm. the small details in the story would change here and there when they were reenacting it. However, the core storyline always remained the same. Also, when left alone together and being secretly recorded by the military, the men did not say anything to one another that suggested that they were lying about the incident. I thought that was pretty interesting. That is interesting. Um... Yeah, because if you left me and you in a room after we made up some shit, as soon as the military left, we'd be like, why the fuck did you say that? (laughs) I mean, it, it, it is an interesting note, but I suppose um, you can always dismiss that by saying this is just a well thought out plan. Yeah. You know, we do not talk about this mm. at all uh, until we are back in our car. We've got a couple of sausages and we're going to meet the babes. <laughs> Speaking of the babes, the girls they oh, claimed yes. to be with that night were unable to be identified or confirmed. There were also slight oh. variations in the timeline. So were these losers pretending that they picked up some hot Swedish chicks? Or did they just get sausages after driving around complaining about their failing marriages? <laughs> we, came out, we came out here to pick up chicks, hot Swedish chicks, and all I've ended up was with a sausage in my mouth. <laughs> it's so funny. In his report, Klaasvan details that the men said they had been at a street called Vengarten in Hoganas, a place that police said didn't exist. However, if you punch Vengarten into Google Maps in 2023, it does show an area 45 minutes south of Hoganas. So, I don't know Hmm. about that. I mean, I guess it didn't exist in Hoganas, but it exists somewhere along the line. And maybe they were so drunk they... Maybe it was missing time, Chris. Is this all just adding to the story or is it taking away? Now I'm confused. <laughs> uh, on top of that, the men said that it had been foggy on the night of the encounter. However, weather reports from that evening showed that it was clear and a little bit drizzly. The days bordering the night of the alleged encounter and after apparently were foggy though. So they just happened to pick the day that wasn't. <laughs> I suppose if it was swamp gas, no, maybe I'm not an expert on swamp gas, but maybe it could have been localized fog, or maybe the uh, like hammer horror the, fog. The, yeah, the, the aliens <laughs> were, were using the the fog as camouflage. Oh yeah, shit! Like when the doors of the the ship opened, it went yeah. so they could breathe the like, the human earth air. Yeah. Like when, whenever Darth Vader's doors open. Yes. <laughs> so after the encounter, Hans and Stig began taking rides on the ferry 
and getting totally wasted for multiple nights. As you do. Their tolerance for booze served them well when a ufologist in Stockholm attempted to get them drunk to confess that their story was a hoax. But the mission failed because Stig and Hans were hardened boozers and could tolerate a lot of it, though no story spilled that night. They met with a lot of ufologists and received a lot of UFO and contactee literature and soon began telling even more elaborate stories. One involving being abducted from a small boat while out on a lake with, quote, a mysterious man. The men said that they were taken to space, where the aliens gave it them a guided tour. Cool. Stig even tried to sell supposed photos of a UFO at one point, but nobody picked them up. Mm. <laughs> it's quite interesting that you mention about them being taken on a tour around the universe. Uh, in this story because th this is something that does crop up frequently in i'm not sure which encounter is it the first kind where you'd board onto a craft and you'd meet the aliens um, i think it's the opposite way but i'm i'm not sure i've definitely read this before on the i think first podcast. is seeing it <laughs> like seeing a ufo in the sky and then it starts to level up well that that would make sense because the movie's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Exactly. Which would imply it's quite serious. Yeah, so. It's not just a movie about a man who saw a thing once. <laughs> I saw it. Oh. Roll credits. Um. It looked so, like this. Roll credits. <laughs> it looked like a giant almond. So but it's interesting to mention it because that comes up again and again and again. It comes up in the... Uh, the Ilkley Moor alien story that we mm -hmm. did quite a while ago and yep. now look it up in the archives, people. Um, so it's it's just interesting that this crops up again. I don't think it gives it any more merit. I just no. think this is a stock experience. All the tropes. Whether this is because it's happening a lot or whether it's because it's just something cool, which is, oh yeah, I got beamed up onto a spaceship and they took me all around the universe. Yeah, I mean, as making up stories goes, if you have that one story... Okay, but I guess after you've told it a thousand times, you start to feel like it's boring. So you might like then make up this other story that's way mm -hmm. more exciting and that kind of like comes after it. You know, I guess if you're doing talks and talking to magazines and you're just like, I punched the blob. Yeah, I punched the blob. We had sausages. I punched the blob. They're like, this fucking sucks. Like we have to come up with some extra, like a sequel for this. Cause... Well, exactly. They're, they're yeah. coming out with a difficult second album now. Exactly. I mean, and then, and then, you know, it comes out and it's a bit weird and it doesn't have the same vibe. And that's kind of what this feels like. But I guess you have to do it in the hoax game, don't you? Mm. <laughs> they were trying to make money off of it. And, you know, I don't think their income was doing that well and their lives were kind of, I guess they needed beer money too for all those ferry parties. Yeah. yeah. But this is always the, the big indicator. Whenever we do any of these stories, we always come back to it. We did it last week. With the Heenies, we've done it previous times before. What did they get out of it? What were they looking for? It. How did they monetize this? Uh, which again, to call back to the Ilkley Moor case, was quite interesting because the person who experienced the abduction there refused. Yeah. Any money. They refused to market it. They refused to kind of do anything apart from taking part in these anonymous reports, which they were doing kind of under the guise of science if you will, but they didn't profit out of this at all, which is the thing in that case, the only thing that makes me pause for a second and go, hang on, there might be something to that. But whenever money starts becoming involved and you're going on tour or you're appearing on shows, you're trying to sell your script to Hollywood, that's where questions start to come into it a lot more because now you're trying to profit off this experience. Exactly. And knowing that these guys were like super wasted all of the time kind of makes it a bit less believable for me too because mm. you know if someone like you know um what was our first episode bob's balls bob's balls like he was you know sober as a judge just a straight up you know dude who never talked about anything like this never had any experience like that and he was like well trusted and respected in his local area and it's like yeah, I, I feel like that's a good story and it's, it makes it more believable. But this is just like two guys who had a bit of a janky timeline and said they met some girls who they couldn't identify or like bring to show the police's evidence or something. And then there was no one else there. They make up the story. I just feel like 
everything is against them for this story. They are they are they are unreliable narrators, definitely. Yeah. And I can also they're messy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm also quite surprised that in that uh, report the Department of Defense put out that they didn't close off with the line, the most unbelievable part of this entire story is that these two picked up chicks. <laughs> I mean, they were handsome guys, like, from the outside. They are, they but are they did appear dapper, to yeah. be, like, the Swedish Chuckle Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy. Toyo. <laughs> We are so stupid. We're also going to have to explain the Chuckle Brothers to our American audience. <laughs> uh, okay, so the, the, the Chuckle Brothers are two middle-aged men from Liverpool, which frame of reference, uh, where, that's where the Beatles from. Uh, and they are they're, they're children's entertainers and they would do, often do stage shows and pantomimes, had their own TV show and Basically, at some point in every episode, they would end up lifting an object <laughs> and their catchphrase, where one of them said, would say, to me, and the other one would say, to, to you. you. <laughs> and, we will post uh, a clip of it on the Patreon for you to see. <laughs> <laughs> Almost an entire episode. It's terrible. Yeah, we'll, we'll post it on the Patreon because, I don't know, maybe you'll find it just freaking weird and funny. So, Chris, what became of Hans Gustafsson and Stig Rydberg? Oh, pray tell. Uh, well, Hans actually passed away in 1960, in the winter of 1960, oh at just 26 years old. He fell off the ferry one night after drinking heavily with friends and fell into the water, never to be seen again. No one saw him fall, but this is what they assumed to have happened, which is a bit spooky. Before he died, he allegedly confessed to his brother that the whole alien encounter and abduction was a hoax. Mm. But Chris, disappearing from the ferry. Very spooky. Very tragic. I didn't see anything. So maybe he was just abducted. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Oh my gosh. He's still up there. Yeah, I mean, it's so tragic. But also in the context of his story, it's kind of spooky. <laughs> it gives me the chills. I don't like that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, just disappearing without a trace. It's a, a note. But how about our... Our other favourite drunken sweet. Well, Stig Reitberg died in 1989. He too had continued to drink heavily for the remainder of his life and contracted pneumonia after being found beaten up and unconscious on the cold ground. Stig and Hans were on bad terms at the time of Hans' death and they were not speaking. Mm. Sad ending to okay. our favourite drunken Swede contactees, to be honest. But yeah, that's what became of them. Did they ever report anything else again so we've had multiple encounters did they just stop? i think stig tried to sell photos of a ufo but you know it was a nobody was playing ball with him on that nobody bought them and the case was just eventually it was published in like a lot of books which is now why you will see the the dumpstin blobs on a lot of like um you know ufo pages and stuff and maybe they're even in mm -hmm. those um top trumps cards i got you if you look again, you might see them there. Yeah, but it was... Oh, quite like Yeah, it. but these books were published and then it came out. I think the Klasvan report came out saying that it was a hoax. So it kind of... The story got out there and then it got disproven. Mm. So some people think that it's an actual case. It's in the book that you bought me, the illustrated one. So, yeah. Mm. Apparently, they also uncovered that there was some Swedish comic strip that had a plot line very similar to their experience with these blob things so and this preceded their experience oh this was before so people are saying oh that it looks like they've just read this comic book which is even more chuckle brothers isn't it that they just read this comic <laughs> book and made up this story so yeah that's the tale of the dumpstian blobs chris oh interesting well you know i, I mean i'm always very eager to want to believe yeah, I mean, there's some spooky elements to it. There are some very spooky elements. You know, I know Septembrio would be like, they were silenced. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, this is this is definitely the the kernel of truth in it. That you know, regardless of what happened to them, the are de they are definitely being hushed by the government. Whether it's because something actually happened and they don't want them to know about it, or whether it's just because it's like, dude, shut the fuck up. We've got like actual <laughs> shit to do 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think it's a very interesting case. There are thousands of these types of cases of people reporting to be abducted. These are two very unreliable people. They have tried to profit endlessly of it. They've even followed up their claims when people got bored of them with further claims of abduction. So uh, as much as I do want to believe this story, and I'm interested in some amorphous blob aliens that resemble (laughs) M&Ms, I am... Sorry, Skittles. There's obviously a difference there. The insides of them are fruity. Then I I, I kind of... Yeah, this one is definitely not one that's up there on my uh, ranking of likely alien incidents. I'll put it that way. Exactly. But I do like the investigative element of this case. And I think it's going to be very useful for us in upcoming alien cases that we look at. So there you have it. Jelly blobs, real or not, please let us know in the Instagram comments at d.s.radio. Patreons, please discuss. We'll be putting all of the reports and everything from books that I found and pictures of the guys up there too. So yes. Let us know on all of our um, on all of our social media platforms. And I'm just thinking, maybe that should be a new t-shirt design, Lens. I believe in Stig and Hans. <laughs> well, the, the soft but tactical. Yeah, soft but tactical. Maybe a sticker. <laughs> speaking of which uh we do have some stickers we've got more we're, we're, we're putting all sorts of things together you can order them through the uh the page that we have over on t public tpublic.com forward slash stores forward slash ds radio um and also we've got a bunch sitting around so we'll probably do some giveaways soon yes 100 percent. sounds good excellent thank you so much chris for listening to the story today no problem thank you very much for telling us uh, of this story together. And I think I, I speak for everybody out there when I say, Linz, yes. when when are we going to finish draining that lock? <laughs> Still need True. part two. True. It's in the making. There's a lot of theories out there, you know, Chris, and some of them are um, more insane than others. <laughs> I, I heard an excellent theory the other day. Tell me. Is it um, ghost Nessie? <laughs> no, but I want to hear that one. Um, I don't know if you're going to cover this, so I'm just going to I'll just briefly uh, touch okay. on it. But I, I heard that apparently one theory uh-huh. is that Nessie is just a whale's dick. <laughs> a dork. <laughs> a dork, yeah. Um, because Nessie is a dork. Now that's a T-shirt. <laughs> if you look at a whale's penis, uh-huh. um, when it, because apparently when they, but when whales like have sex, there's like it's like always like a gangbang, and Ew. they're always like going at it. And one of them will like cruise along with his penis sticking out of the water while it's like waiting for his turn. So oh, people are no. like, maybe, maybe some Scottish whales got into the lock. That's disgusting. And were having just a bit of a three-way, and one of them was just putting its. Uh, putting its dick out there. And if you compare a whale's penis to the sturgeon photograph, they look exactly the same. <laughs> so, but wait a minute. We know that the sturgeon's photograph is a hoax also. So does that well, mean I, I did, the artist I did who made it made well. a dork, a remote control dork? A remote control whale wang. <laughs> I love it. Maybe we should actually do an episode together for the first time ever on all the Loch Ness theories. We can do that. We we can do that. But... Wow, that would be good. We've never done that before. No, but both let's, come uh... armed with theories. That would be great. Let's work mm. on that. But I, I, yes. I'm hearing, I'm hearing the people, Linz. They are crying out to drain the lock. Again. <laughs> All right, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pull the plug on that lock for the next episode. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for telling me uh, that story of of Swedish alcoholics today. And I'm sure all of the listeners were very interested to hear. We'll be back next time. It's going to be my episode next time round. I'll be with you in two weeks' time. If you're new to the podcast, if this is your first time listening to us, go back in the archives. Give us a listen. We've got over 50 episodes of different incidents, not just UFOs. We've got ghosts. We've got Loch Ness Monsters. We've got... um, where did, is Hitler still alive? We've got all sorts of things out there. 
that you can go and listen to. So make sure you go and listen to our back catalogue, follow us on all of our social media platforms. And if you've done all that, if you've been there before, well, buy the T-shirt over at our store at tpublic.com forward slash stores forward slash DS radio. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. I watched through the windshield and saw Hans clutch the pole and the creatures tore at him to get him loose. He was holding the pole and they had him spread out horizontally. (laughs) 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 Ugh. <laughs>